Good morning. Good morning, decided class. Good morning. Um, so hope everybody's doing all right. I'm glad, really glad you were all able to make it here this morning. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone has been able to come every single week during the summer, but we've been doing a series this summer called, you see it up there, Think, Act, and Be Like Jesus. So if you remember the very first week, we did joy, right? So Pastor Brady did joy. And if I were to be completely honest, when I heard Pastor Brady's teaching, I felt like I could just take his notes, find all the words of joy and replace it with hope and just repackage that and give that to you today because I felt like a lot of it was very relevant to what we're talking about, which is hope today. And then we go talk about peace and I feel the same thing, right? Pastor Dave talks about peace and the things that it takes to have peace. And I felt the same thing. A lot of it applies to hope. Last week, Timon talked about self-control in the context of sound Christian doctrine, in the context of Christian living and in the church. And this week, we find ourselves with the characteristic of hope. And, and going back to what I was saying, how everything is related, you know, I was talking to Mike about this right before class, how this, this might be the reason they call it the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, because they're all really related and they're all connected somehow. So with that, let me just open up in a word of prayer before we begin. Heavenly Father, uh, I want to thank you so much for bringing everyone here this morning. Um, thank you for waking us up this morning, giving us this opportunity to delve into what I think is a very important topic, the topic of hope. I pray that you would empty me of myself, fill me with your spirit, guide my words, guide the things that I emphasize, and open up all of our hearts to be able to receive what it is that you have for us, to empty us of any distractions that we might have, and to just focus on what you might want to say to us. Thank you for this time once again, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so like I said, um, I do think that hope is a very important topic. I think it's a fascinating topic. One of the reasons I think that is because I believe hope is very closely tied to one of the big questions in life. So you hear about these big questions in life, right? I think hope is very much tied with the, the question of what is the meaning of life? That question can be stated in many different ways. What is my purpose in life? Why am I here? what brings my life fulfillment, right? But they're all saying the same thing. What is the meaning of life? I also think that hope has a lot of power in it. The moment you take hope away, what do you have? You have depression, right? And, and that's why with a topic like hope, it can be very big, but at the same time, it's something that affects our day-to-day -day living, whether we realize it or not, whether we understand how that truly or fully works. So let's start a little bit small. I want to start with just one concept and then build off of that concept as, as we continue our discussion here. So that concept is this. The things that we place our hopes in, um, if you can't see, I'll, I'll read everything that's on here. The things that we place our hopes in reflect what we believe gives our life meaning and purpose. So this, especially for young people, um, what you think life's meaning is may not be something you can fully articulate. It might be something uh, subconscious, but there is something that pushes you to place your hopes in the things that you decide to place your hopes in, right? So let me start with a question. Outside of the Christian worldview, what are some of the things that people place their hopes in? What are some of the things that people place their hopes in in order to achieve what they believe is the purpose of life? Maybe it's happiness, then they place their hopes in certain things. But outside of the Christian worldview, what is it that gives people purpose and meaning in their life? What do they place their hopes in? Job. Job, that's a big thing. Career, professional security. Family. Family. You can kind of broaden that into um, their children, right? Your spouse. What else? Social endeavors. Social endeavors. You, you, I want people to like me, to love me. Well, that's part of that. Getting attention and losing weight, right? Because for some reason. Um, what else? Sports teams. Sports teams. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, people pour a lot of energy into sports teams, right? And they become very uh, involved with that. Money, yes, yeah, see that's, see Tim? Can I have some of that? Now Tim, Tim was, was showing money and, and that's hugely, you know, the, the accumulation of material wealth becomes the thing that people place their entire life on, they focus on that and nothing else matters and they place all their hope in that because maybe that's what's going to make them happy, that's what's going to give them security. They think life is all about those things. Anything else? Some social causes. Social causes, exactly. Um, 
So I, I was I was at Whole Foods yesterday preparing for this, and I met this really great guy, and he was all about social causes. He was like the president of this uh, not-for-profit organization doing amazing social work around the world. And I asked him what he thought the purpose of life is. He said, uh, "You make what you, your purpose of life is what you make of it. For me, it's, it's doing this to improve humanity, to improve the world. And it's interesting when you go into what he believes spiritually and other stuff. But anyway, so yeah, doing good, bettering humanity, social work, social justice. Um, anything else? Spiritual, some people, they turn to spiritual enlightenment, right? Because they think that uh, spiritual enlightenment will give them what will fulfillment. Um, there's also pleasure in experiencing as many things as possible. So people put their life into traveling the world, experiencing new things. And then there's people who just, they admit, I don't know what life is all about, right? They don't know what the meaning of life is. But if they think that if they get certain things, it's going to shed meaning on that question, and they'll be able to figure out, hey, this is my purpose, and this is what life means. So everything that we've said and discussed so far points to what hope really is. Hope has two components to it, as the dictionary will tell you. The, uh, the two components are desire, here it is, desire and expectation. So for example, this desire and expectation can be expressed in many different levels. I can go to, go to a movie and say, man, I really hope this movie's good, but I have heard not so great things about it. I could say that I, I did really well on this job interview, and I hope I get this job. And on another level, I could say I just did some medical tests today, I got some blood work done, I'm really hoping for some good news. So with all of those things, there are different levels of desire. Your desire can be very strong or not so strong. Your expectation can be very high or it cannot be so very, not so high. But in the deepest sense of the word hope, which is what we're going to focus on today, in the sense of the word of hope that matters the most, hope is the things that we want the most. It's the things that we think will truly satisfy our deepest desires, again, whether we know what those deepest desires are not. So that's really what we're going to focus on, when we, or the definition of hope that we're going to focus on as we talk about today. Next question is, why is hope so important? So in order to... Um, explore this question, I just want to use an illustration. So for example, I'll pick on Kevin and Brady. <laughs> uh, so let's say Kevin and Brady end up in prison for some reason. I don't know why, you can use your imagination. <laughs> Brady and Kevin have the same exact schedule. So Brady and Kevin wake up early in the morning, they go into breakfast, right? And Brady, when he gets his breakfast, he's just thankful he has food, you know? And he's just like, all right, it's all right, but I'm, I'm I'm glad that I have something to eat today. But Kevin, when he gets to the cafeteria, he's like, man, this food is horrible. They need to do something about this. This is not like the food that I used to enjoy, like my steak and my hamburgers back when I was home. And then when they get into like the work that they're doing, Brady does his work very efficiently. He's like, I need to do a good job here and uh, I, I, can't, I can't mess up. And then Kevin's just like, man, this is boring. This is tedious and he's complaining about all the work that he's doing the entire time that he's working. Then they get into recreation and Brady's, Brady's, people are messing with Brady and he's just like, I'm gonna stay away from these people. I don't wanna get into trouble. And Kevin's like, nah, I'm a man's man. Hey, you can't mess with me. So, <laughs> see, I know you. And then you find out that, well, Brady's in prison, but his sentence was only one month. He knows in a month he's gonna be out. On the other hand, Kevin, he earned a sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. So what does that tell you about how people experience their present in terms of hope? What does that tell you about hope and why it's so important? Has anyone been, been able to make that connection? It just seems like it's an outcome. Like, you're, like for us, our outcome is heaven. So yeah. hope is heaven. And we look forward to that. Mm -hmm. So it's, a, it's, it's got something to do with what we're looking forward to, right? right? Your expectation, as we said. What we're looking forward to, exactly. So just to state it briefly, it says, our beliefs about the future radically affect how we experience the present. Do you believe that? It's very true. I think that's very true. Because Brady and Kevin will be in the, they're in the exact same situation, but because of what their beliefs and hopes are about the future, it affects the way they experience the present. This can apply to anything. This can apply to two people who work the exact same job, but there's a huge disparity in their salaries, right? 
This can apply to two people who experience the same diagnosis, but there's a huge disparity in their expectation of healing. And you can apply that to anything. So the point is whether we realize it or not, whether we can articulate it or see it in ourselves, we are helplessly hope-oriented creatures. We are people who place our hope in something no matter what. Um, so I mentioned earlier, I, I mentioned depression earlier, and I wanna go back to that to kind of hammer this point home. So there are people who never get the things that they place their hopes in, the things that they truly desire, they think they truly desire. And when it comes down to it, what happens to them? They live their whole life, or maybe they know that they're never gonna get it. They become regretful, they become shameful, maybe self-hate, but there's depression there because they didn't get what they hoped for. Then there's people who lose something that they really, really desire in their life. And again, they fall into depression. So for example, going back to like a medical diagnosis, you may not have known it before, but the moment you get that diagnosis, you swear to yourself that if I can only get my health back again, I will truly be happy. Or if you lose somebody that you felt gave you purpose and meaning in life, and you lost that person and that person's never coming back, you don't know if you're ever gonna be happy again. So I think on different levels, hopefully you guys can relate to that. Um, I do wanna share an excerpt from an email that I actually wrote about seven years ago to a friend about just to um, describing some of my own experiences with depression. I said, while living in clinical depression, you remember the joy and the happiness that you used to feel. And it literally feels like you will never feel those things again and it terrifies you. You would give anything to feel joy and happiness again. The scariest thing about clinical depression is feeling like it will never end. It's terrifying. Christian or not, every single person lives on hope placed on something, consciously or subconsciously, and without it or when it gets taken away suddenly, we wonder what the point of living anymore is. And I wrote this seven years ago. Um, so you can see how the point of living is directly related to our ability to even have hopes in this life. So before we move on, uh, let me see if there's any comments or questions about what hope is or why hope is so important. It's okay if you don't, but I just want to give you an opportunity to say something or respond. No. Okay. All right. So hopefully that's clear uh, since nobody had questions. Now, there's a problem with hope. Uh, sorry. There's a problem with hope. Problem is that your hopes and my hopes are a lot deeper than we think. So we think, if I can just get this, or if I can just reach this level, if I can get married, if I can find true love, if people can respect me or admire me, if I can write this book, if I can have children, if I can lose 20 pounds, if I can get this bigger house, we think that if I can just get this, then it'll make me happy. It'll bring fulfillment in my life. It'll, it'll be something I can find meaning. So we, we spend our entire lives chasing after these things only to find what? that nothing in this world can truly satisfy us. And I forget who said it, but somebody called this the life lie. They said, this is the life lie. We think that these things will make us happy, but they don't. Uh, so when we finally get these things that we think we're, that are gonna make us happy, we're not happy. We're still unhappy. We still feel like that emptiness in our, inside of us is not fulfilled. And many people get to that point where they realize that these hopes that we have, that we're trying to find fulfillment for in our lives, they're actually insatiable, which means nothing can ever truly satisfy them. So let's look at one of the extremes, which is where you have celebrities or people who are able to get everything they want materially in this world. And a lot of times, what happens to them? They realize, you know, that's it. You know, I reached, I reached this point. Uh, and a very telling quote that I wanted to share here was uh, uh, something that Cynthia Heimel, I don't know if you've heard of her, she's a feminist, she actually passed away earlier this year, but she knew some people who are famous before they became famous, and she wrote a column, and this is an excerpt from it. She says, I pity celebrities, no, I really do. Sylvester Stallone, Bruce Willis, and Barbara Streisand were once perfectly pleasant human beings, but now their wrath is awful. I think when God wants to play a really raw and practical joke on you, he grants you the deepest wish, your deepest wish, and then laughs merrily when you realize you want to kill yourself. You see, Sly, Bruce, and Barbara wanted fame. They worked, they pushed, and the morning after each of them became famous, they wanted to take an overdose. Because that giant thing they were striving for, that fame thing that was going to make everything okay, that was going to make their lives bearable, 
that was going to provide them with personal fulfillment and happiness had happened and they were still them. The, the, disillu the disillusionment turned them howling and insufferable. Anyone ever heard this quote? I, it's very interesting, very interesting. In fact, I think that if I were to ask you guys, if you could just shoot out names of celebrities who've committed suicide in connection with depression, you could probably name quite a few. And even more if I asked you to name people who overdosed in relation to depression. The person I always think of is Robin Williams because he was one of my favorites, right? He, uh, his suicide was connected to his depression and he was a comedian, but he hanged himself at 63. And there's a lot of other people like that. And these kinds of people who can gain everything, who they've gained everything they could ever materially want in this world, they conclude one of either two things, that they're never gonna get that fulfillment that they have, or two, that there is no meaning in life, and then they become depressed, and they become suicidal. But when it comes to reaching a goal on any level, something even on our, on our level, we're not celebrities, we're not you know, super rich, but on any level in general, when people do reach their goals and they find out that it is not there, what do they end up doing? They end up looking for it in other things. Maybe another spouse will have it. Maybe another career will have it. Maybe making more money will have it. Maybe if I just get a bigger job, I will find it there. Some people turn to spiritual schools of thought like Hinduism, Buddhism, New Age thinking, even though they don't realize it's New Age thinking. Uh, some people turn to escapism, right? And I think this applies to everyone, whether you reach your goals or not, whether you lose it. Um, people who turn to escapism will turn to things like drug, drugs, sex. They'll turn to even little things like movies, you know, turning to going to other places, other countries, visiting other cultures, traveling, uh, whatever, even sleeping, turning to art or a hobby. And the reason they do that is because they think that the world is a dark place and if they can just get away from it, there's gonna be a little bit sense of reprieve. But the point of this is that our deepest desires are deeper than we think and nothing in the world will be able to truly satisfy our deepest longings. And the Bible does speak of this. Um, in Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse 11, who wrote Ecclesiastes? Solomon. Solomon, right? So Solomon, the wisest person in the world at that time, had all the wealth he could ever want. We read later on that he drifts away from God. He has, what, a thousand wives and concubines. And this is what he says in Ecclesiastes chapter two, verse 11. He says, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity or meaningless and a striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So this is from the wisest man at that time and basically saying what we have up here. So again, our deepest, our desires are deeper than we think and nothing in this world will be able to truly satisfy our deepest longings. So one of my favorite authors is C.S. Lewis, as some of you may be for you guys too. He, also, he has a chapter in Mere Christianity called Hope, right? So maybe some of you have read it. In this chapter, he says this. Um, Most people, if they had really learned to look into their own hearts, would know that they do want and want acutely something that cannot be had in this world. There are all sorts of things in this world that offer to give it to you, but they never quite keep their promise. The longings which arise in us when we first fall in love or first think of some foreign country, or first take up some subject that excites us, are longings which no marriage, no travel, no learning can really satisfy. I am not now speaking of what would be ordinarily called unsuccessful marriages, or holidays, or learned careers. I am speaking of the best possible ones. There was something we grasped at in that first moment of longing which just fades away in the reality. I think everyone knows what I mean. The wife may be a good wife, and the hotels and the scenery may have been excellent, and chemistry may be a very interesting job, but something has evaded us. So let me pause once again. Any questions or comments about the problem of hope? So this is the problem that I'm presenting, which is nothing in this world can really satisfy us. Concur? Agree? Awesome. So with that, let's see what Christianity has to offer, all right? So, Everybody is searching for the meaning in life or they think they have the answer to it. Certainly every religion will offer you an answer to what the meaning or purpose in life is. But I believe that Christianity alone is the worldview that can offer you an answer to this problem that is coherent, that corresponds to reality, 
and also sufficiently explains all of the subtopics that come with this problem. So subtopics like a reality beyond the material world, the existence of a soul, the nature of man, and a whole lot of other things. So we're going to look at what Christianity has to offer. And I want to start by showing this clip of Tim Keller, where he shares some pretty profound insights from J.R.R. Tolkien. Who was J.R.R. Tolkien? He wrote The Lord of the Rings. So let me share this uh, video real quick. Tolkien predicted, rightly, that human beings, including adult human beings, would never, ever, ever get past their insatiable desire for fantasy fiction. And here's what he said the reasons were. He says, take a look at, at fairy tales and science fiction. Here's what you have in them. You have stories in which people escape death, in which they step outside of time, in which they uh, have communication with intelligent beings that are not human, in which they have love that they never, ever lose, love without parting, and in which evil tr completely is, is defeated by good. Good triumphs over evil. Now, he says, when you, the reason why human beings keep spending billions and trillions of dollars to read or watch or consume stories like that, what we would call fairy stories, is because we are endlessly fascinated by these subjects. Even when we know they're fiction, of course, even though we know it's not true, but there's something deeply consoling about a well-told story, realistically uh, depicted, in which people escape death and live forever or have love without parting, or communicate with non-human beings, uh, or uh, step outside of time. We're just fascinated by, by it. We have this incredible appetite. Why? Because we want those things. It's the reason why real life will never satisfy us. We're reading those stories, and if they're told well, they still console us, even though it's bittersweet, and it tells you something about the human heart and the human soul. The human heart and the human soul wants those things. We, and we can't not want those things. Well, that's ridiculous. That's silly. Life is over. It's, when you die, that's the end of it. You can't escape time. You can't have love without parting. Everybody you love, you're going to lose. They're going to go away from you, or something's going to happen, or they're going to die, or you're going to die. This is silly. Why do, we keep, why do we keep reading and watching these stories? Tolkien says, because that's what the human heart wants. And realistic fiction cannot scratch that itch. Isn't that crazy? I mean, I know, I know uh, when I first heard this, I, I felt like, yes, that is so true. Because, you know, I, I like a good sci-fi or <laughs> fantasy story, right? And it just never occurred to me like that. What I find fascinating about that, that is, to listen to that, and his comment is about real life. I think that's the gist of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it for a second, what he's talking about, he says, real life's not like that. Real life is like that. What we experience life is as outside of Christ is not real life. It's not real life. No. Or it's not you're something dead. that... You're dead in the spirit. That's yeah, it's not something that is, uh, you know, something eternal, right? So... Yeah. And we're going to go into a lot more of what Mike was just talking about. Um, but, ba you know, what Tim, what Tim Keller, and, and Tim Keller has taught me so much. Uh, I love, you know, his, his teaching. Basically, he's concurring with what we've been saying, right? So the things that we want or place our hopes in this world, they can't realistically, right? They can't realistically give us the satisfaction that we're looking for. So we're always left with a degree of disappointment or a degree of emptiness. That's because... Well, I, I've concluded that, or many people have probably concluded, that anything that all hopes and proposed meanings of life that are tied to material things, to created things, to incoherent spiritual philosophies, any, any hope that you have that is tied to those things will never go beyond the grave. And that's exactly why what we, what you believe about what happens to you after you die actually and truly matters. Some people say it doesn't matter. But what you believe about that really does matter. And many of you know that C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien were good friends, right? And it's been documented that, that as they were walking along the way, 
Uh, C.S. Lewis says to Tolkien, yes, the old myths and stories, they're wonderful, but myths are lies, though breathed through silver. And then what does Tolkien say? Have any of you heard this? Tolkien, Tolkien says, no, not if Christianity is true. And C.S. Lewis, you know, after he is converted from atheism to Christianity, he goes on to write this, which is very much related. He says, the Christian says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger, well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim, well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual desire, well, there is such a thing as sex. If I find in myself a desire with no experience in this world, which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it, to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care on one hand never to despise or be unthankful for these earthly blessings, and on the other hand, never to mistake them for, some, for the something else of which they are only kind of a copy or echo or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country. So, what does Christianity have to offer? If Christianity is true, then all our desires, which are tied down to the material things, the created things, they are real, but they point to something that is much greater. They are simply a shadow of the truer things. If Christianity is true, then there's a meaning and purpose in life that will truly satisfy our deepest longings and desires. And if Christianity is true, then we were meant for things like love without parting, as Tim Keller puts it. True love, for a relationship with someone beyond humanity. We were meant to step outside of time and live forever. And we were meant to overcome death if Christianity is true. So, those of you who know me or may have heard me teach or speak in some capacity have probably heard me say this, but I will always keep saying it and I'll say it again. <clears throat> I understand why we tell our children to accept Jesus into their heart so that they can go to heaven and not go to hell. I understand. But there has to come a point where we give them more because the gospel is much more than that. If that's all the gospel is about, then what hope do I have in this life? Why should I care about other people? Why should I care about what happens in this world? And having that mindset, I think, many times helps pe makes people go into extremes with their Christianity because they only receive a truncated part of the gospel or they're not able to, to piece together the many different parts of the gospel that get thrown at them at, at different times in their life. <clears throat> and when I say extreme, I'm talking about people who hold those picket signs in very inappropriate places, people who blow up abortion clinics, um, extremes where people walk away from the Christian faith because it's not relevant to them. They don't understand how, what is this, how is this going to help my life. And then there's everything in between. So, what is the gospel? The gospel tells us that God created a perfect world in the, in the beginning. But what broke his perfect world? Mankind's sin destroyed God's perfect world. It destroyed primary, primarily three things. Sin destroyed our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, and our relationship with the entire of all creation. So I have some verses here. We're not going to read through the verses, but that's just there for you. Um, but despite our sin breaking God's perfect creation, it was God's amazing love. So there's that love without parting part. God's love provided a way for everything to be fixed. What sin destroyed, he provided a way for it to be fixed. This is the true reason that Jesus put on human flesh. This is the true reason he came and died for the sins of mankind. It was to reconcile us back to God, which is that relationship with the being beyond humanity part, but to reconcile us back to God, to reconcile us with one another, and ultimately to reconcile us with all of creation. So yes, going to heaven, it's part of that. It's very much part of that. But that's not the main thing. The main thing is that through Jesus, sins can be forgiven and we can be reconciled back to a, a holy God. We can have a relationship with a holy God because sin has been dealt with. And we can learn to love other people the way that Jesus loves us. So this is where repentance, confession, forgiveness come in, right? This is the piece that we, we tend to, to give people first because, yes, that is what drives all of this. But that's where that part of that where that's where that part of the gospel comes into play. And then once that happens, once we enter into a relationship with God, we become new creatures. We become new creations. And this begins the process of restoring us back to wholeness. And wholeness will be the key word that I'm going to keep harping on. 
wholeness. Wholeness meaning the way that we were originally meant to live life, the way that we were originally meant to experience life before our sin destroyed everything that God created. And the beauty of that is that the restoration process already begins today. When I hear John 3.16 and I hear the part that says, shall not perish and have everlasting life, for most of my life I only thought of being in heaven and living forever in heaven. I didn't realize until much later on that everlasting life really refers to your life today and it begins the moment you choose to follow God, to choose to follow Christ. So, once we enter into that relationship with God, our personal sanctification and the manifestation of Christian living, I just want to make sure I have the right, there you go, okay. Our personal sanctification and the manifestation of Christian living. This is part of the process of experiencing life the way that it was meant to be lived. And then when we die, we have the promise of spending eternity in the presence of God because of what Jesus Christ did for us. What does that mean? That means we as Christians, we have a hope that is twofold. We have a hope that is both in this life, but also a hope that goes beyond this life, in the afterlife, after death. And there's that overcoming death and living beyond death part of fantasy that we, that we tend to be fascinated over. So, Luke chapter 8 verse 1 says, Soon afterward, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. I have highlighted the words, good news of the kingdom of God. Good news is what? The gospel. That's what the gospel means, right? Good news means the gospel. Luke is telling us that the kingdom of God is the gospel. In Matthew 24, 14, Jesus says, This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. Everywhere that Jesus went, Jesus spoke about the kingdom. It was very central to his teachings. You'll see um, you know, many different verses where you, Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom of God. There are numerous verses like that. And the same can be said about the apostles. I have a couple here if you just want to take a look at it. But the point being, the kingdom of God was central to the teachings of Jesus and to the, apostle, to the apostles. Not the impossibles, the apostles. <laughs> so, in presenting the gospel, it seems fitting to me that we should spend time talking about the kingdom. And I think it'll bring home the point about what the Christian hope really is. So when you ask people, what is the kingdom of God? This could be a whole nother class, I admit. So normally maybe I'd like to hear some input, but I'm just going to share. Uh, so what is the kingdom of God? You'll get different answers like this. The kingdom of God is heaven. The kingdom of God is God's future reign over the new heaven and the new earth. It's the church. It's in your heart. It's spiritual. It's social reform. And the answer really is, they're all right, right? So there's an element of truth in each of these answers, and they're all connected somehow. So here's a few things to remember. Um, I apologize if you can't see that. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you can, can you see it? So there's a few things I want you to remember about the kingdom of God. Again, I'm not going to be able to go too deeply into it, but the main things I want you to see are, the kingdom of God is present but future. It is here and it is near. So we see that the kingdom of God is already here but not yet here in its fullness. And, and if you've heard of this, word, this term, they've coined the term already not yet to describe the kingdom of God. Has anyone heard that? Already not yet? Yes. So that's, that's the, the term that I guess I'm going to use now uh, to describe the kingdom. But other things are about the kingdom are that the kingdom is inside you. The kingdom is around you. There are components that are seen. There are components that are unseen. So we're not going to go through all these scriptures, but it's a very good study if you want to dig deeper into it. And in the very first class where we talked about joy, Brady actually talked about this already not yet aspect of the kingdom. And I think this is what ties it all together. So I want to go a little bit more into what does that mean already not yet? So first of all, you enter into the kingdom of God at the point of conversion, right? So uh, Jesus says in John 3, 3, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And the already part of the kingdom of God tells us that God's redeeming touch, his business of making things and people whole again, is already at work today. As a Christian, it's already at work inside you. And your wholeness is not limited to the physical. It's your soul and it's your spirit. So when we talk about the already part, of the kingdom of God inside us. That's referring to our salvation, number one, the process of sanctification, right? So, and also our relationship with God. When we talk about the around us part, the kingdom of God around us, that's Christian living being, that's Christian living in the world around us, sound doctrine being lived out, 
that's social justice. And I know social justice is, I'm talking about true social justice where you really do care about um, the poor, the, the marginalized. Then there is you know, the, the aspect of miracles. The not yet part inside of us, the kingdom of God is already in us, but it's not yet here in its fullness. Why? Because we still struggle with sin. We still have struggles day to day with everything we experience. We still experience sin and death, but one day we will be resurrected with new sinless bodies, right? The kingdom of God is already here around us with social living, but it's not yet here in its fullness because we still can live in hypocrisy. Again, disease and death. There is still social injustice around in this world, but God will be faithful and he will complete his work in us. He will one day right all wrongs and there will be a new heaven and a new earth. So remember I said that all hopes that are tied down to material things will never go beyond the grave. But Christianity offers a hope that is tied down or anchored in the finished work of Christ. And because of that, we have a hope that is both in this life and also beyond this life. So let's go full circle. Oh yeah, before I say that, the already part, again, as you probably already have realized, is our present hope. The not yet part is the, the aspect of our future hope as Christians. So what does Christianity have to offer? What is the purpose and meaning of life according to Christianity? The purpose and meaning of life is the pursuit of the kingdom of God, because now you understand what the kingdom of God is. It's the pursuit of the kingdom of God inside us, around us, and the process of becoming whole again. What do we place our hope in? We place our hope in the finished work of Christ, in Jesus. Because of Jesus, we have, we, he is what makes the meaning of life possible in the first place. Any questions or comments? I just want to make sure I, and everyone understands so far. Hopefully that was clear. Give you a chance to talk. All right. So lest I leave you with an impression that once you become a Christian, you never become hopeless. I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about when Christians lose hope. So when a Christian falls into hopelessness and despair and depression, what is some practical advice that we can give? Or even for ourselves. Um, surely many people, not just me, have fallen into that. Or maybe you're feeling that today. So what kind of practical advice can we give to a Christian who has fallen into hopelessness? Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Spend your time immersed in the word. That's mm -hmm. very important. I think in like the most loving and gentle way possible, try to find the core of it because it means they're idolizing something which you don't like to think about during depression. Yes. <laughs> like you're idolizing something, but you're putting your hope into something else. And yes. depression does not come from hope in God. Yes. No fear. Fear. All fear has to leave when we exactly. have hope in God. So finding the core of it, finding what they're putting their hope in and their trust in, in this world, and doing our best to turn yeah. from it. Yeah, that is, I think that is extremely important, and I think you hit the nail right on the head, because, and I will say this, that a lot of times, the core of our depression is self, right? So one of the best definitions I've heard of sin is putting self over God, and a lot of times the reason we're depressed is we, because we choose, or we can't, yield our will to God's will. And, and it's whatever the reason is, you're essentially placing, or you're idolizing something else over God. You're placing yourself and your, your self-desires. And I realize that that's a very hard truth to, to come face to face with. Um, I know years ago, when, when I saw a Christian counselor for some of the things I was dealing with, that's what he told me. That's exactly what he said. And it was hard for me to accept it. But, that, but accepting that and understanding how that applied to me is really what the first step towards my, my own healing. So, so thank you. Yeah, that was very, very on point. What else? What else can we say? Then, sorry. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> be available. I think I, I, I'm not one that dwells in the mercy thing. Like, in the what? I, mercy thing. Like I, I usually, you know, you know what I mean. But. The truth is, is that I think listening and asking questions yeah. is better than maybe statements a lot of times mm -hmm. because you're always trying to draw out them to conclude to something rather than just telling them what they're right. Now right. there might be practical advice, and I think maybe yeah. that's what I was trying to do. Dates, 
However, I think so, just be available. Don't be condemning. You know, there's so mm. much tone. Those there's of, a way to say things, right? Questions yeah. And try to get them to maybe look differently, not just tell them they got to look different. You know what I'm right, saying? Like, right, right. Look at something. Different. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and I think that's similar to something Mike said a couple of weeks back, mm. just to be available, to be there, to listen. And, and a lot of what you said does ring true, where you're not, uh, the way you say things does matter, and the way that you relate to people. And a lot of times people can't be receptive, even though you're saying the right thing, but if you're not saying it in the right way. And I think being there is, is a huge thing, um, if you have a brother or sister who is in that. So there is one yeah, more thing? I was thing? just going to say, well, a couple of things. One, we have to realize that there are different kinds of depression. Yeah, Sometimes yes, really yes. Sometimes there really isn't. Right, right. It's not always the case, and a lot of times they don't know why they are as depressed as they are. Right. But the one thing I think is huge is what we can say. I mean, the truth of the gospel is clearly the truth. Yes. And God is, He is the only thing that is always going to be exactly what we say. Yeah. I mean, so even, even when somebody. I think when they are dealing with depression, even if they don't know why they're there, God is still yeah. love and He is still truth and He still can be their hope. Right. While they're and their mindset can different. still change. So right. I'm not saying that um, you know you should always just stick to spiritual guidance and maybe you know taking medication is appropriate at times. Sometimes people don't know why they're depressed. Yes. But when we speak, I love what you said, because when we speak truth into them from Scripture, it doesn't come back void. It's gonna, it's powerful, and it can still help them if, if that's what we're speaking into their life. So, yeah. Yep. Like, super honesty right now. Mm -hmm. Like, this is my first day, like, first Sunday out of a mental, like, a mental hospital. Right? Yeah, I hear you. Like, it's tough. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing, and I appreciate that, that honesty. You, you don't really know a person's story, right? And I think that's connected to what Kevin was just saying. And you really need to be open to listening and to <clears throat> asking questions and the way that we speak to them. So no, I appreciate that. Yeah. I feel like in my experience with you know, being there for friends who are with or friends or whatever, um, it has to be very careful because it doesn't always work for everyone. Sometimes sharing your testimony can be helpful as well because it can be powerful. Um, kind of showing them that maybe you're not, you haven't gone through exactly what they're going through. Yeah. Or, or even if you have, everyone's story is different. Yep. But maybe kind of just letting them know that it's fine for you. Yeah, and I think that's one of the uh, things that when you are going through your own stuff, you know. We should be asking ourselves, you know, what, what is God trying to teach mm -hmm. us? And also realizing that what we go through can help somebody else in the future. And that could be part of the reason that you experience some of the things that you do in life. So that's very true. Yeah. Um, from like a, a practical standpoint, is like, I think, I think of two things. Mm -hmm. One is the more, the more practical side of not invalidating. Mm -hmm what they're going through, acknowledging how real it is, because their perception is reality at that moment in that time with what they're going through. Right, it's very right. real. And to acknowledge it for the power it holds in their life at that time. Yeah. And then I think of um, just what is a really good <laughs> way to say it, but the fact that God is outside of time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. God's completely outside of time. He's already seen that this has happened. He already knew what this was happening, whether it was because of sin or whether it was just because you don't exactly know what's going on. It's just a dark time of depression or whatever it might be. But God's outside of all that. He's already seen you on the other side of it. He already knows if or how he's going to use that. Yeah. And he was there before it. So the fact that he's outside of whatever parameters of right. this life we have. And trusting in that, knowing that we can trust in that. That's yeah, a very good point. I think that all these things are so true. It, it seems like different people can gravitate towards different solutions, and there's like so many different ways that a person can be helped. It's a, usually a combination of, a, of several small things that can mm -hmm. help you a lot to get mm -hmm. started. That's true. One of the things that helped me a lot was in Psalm 42, where it says, 
Why art thou downcast, O my soul? Why so disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I will yet praise him, who is the help of my countenance and my shield. Mm -hmm. And it's like talking to yourself, building in the habit of talking to yourself and, and uh, questioning yourself. Why are you allowing yourself to feel this way? And, you know, there's plenty of reasons to rejoice. And the other thing was um, just uh, learning to recognize the patterns of, of behavior. Sometimes, like Pat said, they can come without any reason. Other times, right. they can come from outside stimulus when you get these depressed moods. Right. And, uh, Sometimes recognize that you can write in journals and can help you to see when there was a pattern or something negative that happened to you, right. or whether it just kind of came upon you like a, a, a spiritual oppression from the from Yeah, the yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. I believe that our Lord is in uh, the process of preparing his people, the body of Christ, to be dry. And, um, just as a personal illustration, when I first came to the world, I was older, and I was embraced by people of faith. I was included, I was okay. getting a lot of help, and you know, and, and a lot of positives. And I'm, I'm in an unusual situation now, and there is a lot of misunderstanding on what my thinking is. Okay. <laughs> and, um, I have, in some locations, not here, but in some locations, been ousted hmm. the family of God. Okay. And um, unfortunately, slander accompanied that and traveled many miles, even on roads from Kentucky, we had a place of God under there. And uh, this is why I spoke to my forgiveness when I was talking to yeah. some of the rest of the folks. Yeah, no, yeah, I remember. Because I think we, we need to, um, as a body, we need to reflect the words love not only to the outside world and unsafe, but to one another. And um, to be uh, each of us individual first, that was working to each to come from yeah. each of us to yeah. his image. And um, but I think as a body like one saying hands on the feet and stuff like that <laughs> kind of thing to work for us uh, together so that um, we make a difference in the world for his purposes. Yeah. Yeah. And showing that love and doing our part. I'm sorry. And showing that love that you were talking about and, and doing our part as the body of Christ. Well, acceptance yeah. and, and inclusion and not um, condemning and yeah. ousting somebody because you don't like Or at least handling say. situations in an appropriate way, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> or at least handling situations yeah, in, in an appropriate way. Peace and love. And love. And peace and my love, yes, absolutely. Wrong. I'm not saying that, but it's, it's, uh, yeah. it's this is re reached. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Well, thanks for sharing. One more. I was, um, I'm kind of studying this summer about contemplative prayer and mm -hmm. thinking about there's a lot of times when we have an issue, we want to do, do, do. What can I do about it? These are the steps to do. And that maybe there's some just sitting with God and telling Him, like, this is how I'm asking Him the question. Is, Why is my soul so downcast? Yeah. What, and I, just the time of just sitting with him instead of telling him what you want him to do can create the transformation that brings us hope. We can't, we can't make ourselves have hope right. that he transforms us. To yeah, and I think, you know, being in the presence of God, and if it's somebody else, even just spending prayer time with them, right, and spending that time with God. One more. I've been through a lot of hard times That it was okay, but not okay out there. But to try to move forward past that, to see the situation in his eyes, you know, does my, you know, my bitterness or my, my disappointment in the situation that I, you know, just went through. Yeah, and you're speaking from experience, so, so that's good advice. And I'm sure a lot of you are speaking from experience, but. You know, as we said, Christians are not immune to losing hope. We're not immune to depression. But hopefully, you know, we have... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, the idea of hope. Hope comes through patience. Mm-hmm. 
There is a scripture that says, you know, our tribulations give us endurance and endurance works that, that hope in us. So I think you're very on point with that. Um, and it is something like with a lot of the other characteristics that we've been talking about, it takes effort. It takes, um, it takes time. It doesn't just, it's not something that just comes to you. It's something that gets pruned inside of us, you know, and, and, you know, for, for you, you know, I praise God for your own victory. I'm sure you still have your own struggles and, you know, but we want to get to that point where we're able to, you know, internalize some of those lessons and practice it so that when we get to that point, we know what to fall back on, right? Build a foundation. Build a foundation. And, and that's a perfect, like, segue into our official verse of the day. Uh, so our official verse is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19 through 20. And I think it beautifully ties everything in that we're talking about. But I have up here some of the preceding verses because I think it's good to put some context into it. So I'm going to read uh, a little bit before our main verse. It says in Hebrews chapter 6, starting in verse 9, Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no greater... No one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. And remember, Abraham didn't obtain all of the promise you know, in this lifetime, in his lifetime. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. So the main verse that we want to focus on is 19. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain. So what is this hope that we have? If you look back to verse 9 and 10 in the previous slide, it's the hope of a full assurance of salvation. And what do we say salvation entails? Salvation entails a full assurance of us becoming whole again. It's a full assurance of God's kingdom. So this is the gospel. I love describing the gospel as reconciliation, renewal, and restoration because I feel like that perfectly pictures what the gospel is. And in fact, if I were to sum up what the kingdom of God is in one short sentence, it would be the kingdom of God is everything that has been, is being, and will be redeemed through Jesus Christ. So let's look at the word anchor for a second. Something, an anchor is something that keeps you rooted or grounded, right? Something that holds you steady, holds you in place. When our soul is anchored with hope in other things apart from Christ, like other people, money, wealth, accomplishments, a storm that causes everything to come crashing down around your life will, will just, it's not, what, what you place your hopes in will not be enough to hold you or keep you together. It will break you. But when our hope is anchored with a hope that is in Christ, our entire life can come crashing down on us, but our anchor that keeps us grounded is Jesus Christ. Only Jesus can keep us grounded when everything really starts falling apart. You know, um, was it, uh, so I thought this question might come up, but I think it's important to, uh, to say, when people claim that they have found peace and hope and joy in something else, like another religion or another mm -hmm. you know, belief system, what do I say to that? What do you say to that? So I think that when that happens, people think they have found hope and peace in something else. You have to look at whether what they believe coheres with reality. So someone who believes that suffering is an illusion, that doesn't cohere with someone who is suffering from starvation or someone you know, who's going through physical pain. That, they're not going to look at that and say, hey, that makes sense. You know, suffering is illusion. Um, and a lot of times, so, so we can go more into that. But the other thing is also when people have, think they have found it in something else, a lot of times this hasn't been tested. So when life really happens or an extreme in life happens, what happens to these people? That's what I would question. So I think it's important to, to point out here that the anchor that we have is Christ as Christians. And if you also notice in the previous verses, they give you the example of Abraham. And I kind of mentioned it before. Abraham is an example that's in Romans chapter 4. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13, it says that Abraham and many other people 
did not, exp did not fully get the things that were promised to them until after the grave. So again, this points to the fact that the, the, these heroes of the Bible who, who had these hopes set before them, their hope was in something that was also beyond the grave, but they died in faith knowing that they would receive it. And then the second part of our verse for scripture passage for today is, um, we have this as assurance, death, best anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, the very presence of God, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, become a high, having become a high priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. So what does that mean? Um, in the next chapter, it delves more deeply into Mil the topic of Melchizedek. Chapter 7, it brings up Abraham again in this context. It talks about a change in the priesthood, how that was needed, and with that came a necessary change in the law. And I do want to read a little bit of chapter 7. In chapter 7, starting in verse uh, 19, it says, For the law made nothing perfect, but on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath, for those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this, was one, but this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor, guarantor of a better covenant. So I think that last verse sums it up very well. Jesus is our forerunner. He is our great high priest who entered first into the presence of God. And because of that, you know, a foreigner is someone who goes first where others follow. So we can follow Jesus into the very presence of God. And that is something we can do now, today. And we can experience the, the gifts that God gives to us, the, the gifts of the kingdom, and that it, in our daily living now and have that actually be relevant to our lives right now. So, is that it? Yes, that's it. So that's, that's what I wanted to share today. I do want to, uh, I want you to keep in mind that you know, we're talking about hope, and but, the, but proving whether Christianity is true or not, that's kind of out of scope of our discussion today in class. We can definitely go into it. But for a lot of people, they're not really interested in digging into Christianity unless, they can, unless and until they, they can see that if Christianity was true, that it would actually make a difference in their lives, that it's actually relevant to their lives. So hopefully that was helpful for somebody today, for people today. Uh, before I close, was there any last thoughts or questions? I don't know compared to what you were sharing with there about the intimacy with God. I'm saying it for the first time, I never really saw it before. The mm -hmm. inner place behind the curtain, yeah. connected to the anchor, where your anchor is in that place of intimacy with God, where the high priest was only allowed to go there behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. When Jesus died, we all know the curtain was there. So right. not every right. time each one of us goes into our prayer closet, we're going behind that curtain. That's right. To go to. We have the intimacy with God, and when you establish that and maintain that intimacy, you have that anchor. So when that big storm hits you and everything just falls apart, your chances of, of making it through that storm intact are going to be a lot better. Right, because right. You're anchored. And the other thing I'm saying is the high priest part is that we're all priests as well. The Bible says the Bible says mm -hmm. you're the kingdom of priests, mm -hmm. royal priesthood. And the yes. And functioning yeah. in that priestly role, which means maybe when I feel most depressed, when I need to go to the nursing home and encourage somebody else. When we begin right. functioning in yeah. that high priestly role, then the Lord helps us to get rid of that, uh, what I think Chuck Swindoll called the inward eyeball itis. <laughs> How do we better function in that role? How do we better function in that role? It, it's only through staying in the Word every day. Right? Yeah. Right. Like it's only through being in Scripture and just constantly being in overflow. Yeah, immersing yourself in those things, immersing yourself in the presence of God in the scriptures. Priestly state. Yeah. And it's a good point because if you know about some of the things in, in the Old Testament, we're past that veil where only the high priest was able to go, only once a year even, and he had to offer a blood sacrifice. Now we have, if you compare that picture of how much, of how difficult it was, right, back then. And then we know in the New Testament it says that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. It's such a contrasting difference. But we have that. We have direct access to the presence of God because of what Christ did. And I think what you guys ended was just like exactly on point because, you know, when I speak to people who are depressed sometimes, one of the things I tell them is just really be conscious and make an effort to immerse yourself in things of God. And it's, it's bound to have an effect on you. So anything else? All right, so let me close in prayer. Heavenly Father, um, once again, I, I thank you for this opportunity to talk about hope, such, 
such a really important topic that I think affects each of us every single day. I thank you for the hope that we have in the gospel. I thank you for what you've done, allowing us to have this beautiful, beautiful hope in, our, in ourselves because of you, a hope that we can latch onto that anchors our very soul, that tells us that you know, we were meant for something we were meant for something better, and you have provided that way for us. I pray that we would be able to live our lives in this hope, to live our lives in the present hope that we have, that you give to us, affect that change inside of us, allow it to be something that we live out so that other people can feel that. And for those who are living with some degree of hopelessness or despair, I pray that you would just touch them and reach out to them and, and help them to know that the hope that we have is something that is lasting, something that can keep us sol on solid ground no matter what comes our way. And I thank you so much for that. I pray for... Uh, every single person in this room that you would just continue as we continue to grow together in learning about these characteristics as we learn to think, act, and be like you, Lord, which is our ultimate goal, Father. And I pray you would uh, bless the rest of our study, bless the rest of this day as we prepare our hearts as we go into service today and, and prepare for more of worship and learning more about your word, Father. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. I give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.